Uh, we're going live. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to a very special edition of the Austin Hiss Community Sunday Gathering. We are we are Sunday morning live, and uh, we're we're thrilled to have you with uh, the new social experiment that that uh, coronavirus has foisted upon us all. Welcome, welcome. Uh, today we have a very exciting guest, a very exciting speaker, someone who's driven all the way down from Minnesota, snowy Minnesota, to join us and talk with us today about the right to die final exit network and and the the book that started it all uh, final exit the, the history of this movement the 25 year history of this of this movement uh, the final exit network is in fact the largest national organization dedicated to end of life freedom for anyone of sound mind facing an intolerable quality of life due to illness or pain now kevin is a board member of the Final Exit Network, and has also developed a course specifically for the Austin Humanist Association about the right to die uh, movement. Is that right, Kevin? The American Humanist Association. Or did I say Austin Humanist Association? No, no, no. In the future, perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> well, we'll have to put a bug in his ear so it will make uh, that that happen for us. But we're we're thrilled to have you with us here today. Uh, and yes, yes, we have enabled chat. Uh, so please feel free to, to, to chat, to, uh, to join in on the conversation here, uh, both live and, and after the fact. This video will be available after this recording on our YouTube channel. Uh, yes, Kevin Bradley is not only on the board of the Final Exit Network, but he, uh, is a hospice chaplain, a humanist chaplain, and co-founded the Interfaith Clergy for End of Life Options. It's been a real pleasure getting to know Kevin just over the phone and via email over the last few weeks, and and we've we've been we've been working to to get him to come and speak with us now for for some time. Uh, I'm the third president now who's been in contact with Kevin Bradley, so we are thrilled to at last have Kevin Bradley here to speak with us today. So I hope you'll join me in giving a, a big a big hand to Kevin Bradley. Thank you. What's that? That is live applause, actually. Well, this is indeed an uh, uh, opportunity. It's both the experiment to try the uh, live feed. And, uh, and I've been thinking, okay, Melanie, I guess I need to get my own YouTube channel now. Uh, you know, <laughs> so, so. Uh, I do have a presentation here. Um, how do we get the PowerPoint up here? Is this it right here? Is it PPP yet? Yep. Oh, okay, good. Great. And we just need to. I made it all go away. There we go. Technology is working. So I guess uh, they don't get to see my face now because we have this up here. I'm not sure exactly what gets streamed. Is it just the uh, PowerPoint with my technical people? Or we're working on, working on so we'll we'll All right, so we're just gonna continue. All right, so the title of the presentation, Your Life, Your Death, Your Choice. Uh, moving forward, but someone mentioned the fact that I'm from Minnesota. So I just thought to let you know that was three weeks ago in my backyard. Uh, so if anybody complains about the snow in Austin, you do not get any sympathy from me. Uh, and that's uh, another backyard picture, and that's the front yard. So welcome to Minnesota. So who am I? Well, uh, just to give you some background, and it's not because I'm important, but I want to give you a framework as sort of where I come from. You know, how is uh, my history shaped where, you know, these presentations. So I have 35-some years as a professional writer and trainer and uh, editor. And along the way, uh, at the tender age of almost, uh, I have no idea how old I was, when I out of nowhere decided to go to seminary full time, uh, who knew? Uh, and then I got a master's degree in counseling. And after that, I did some postgraduate work and I worked at the Mayo Clinic Health System. Most of my training in chaplaincy was at the VA hospital in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It just happened to be coincidentally that the year I started seminary, my son also went to the Air Force. 
when I got out of seminary, he came home from the Air Force with this thing called PTSD, and I had no clue what that was. So when I was at the VA hospital, I had the opportunity to focus on a, on a particular field. I chose mental health because when you're dealing with mental health at a VA hospital, it is PTSD. So that's where I learned that PTSD is highly linked to addiction and, and depression. And if you don't treat them all uh, holistically, often they fall through the cracks. So, uh, so I was able to help that. And that experience helped me with my son. But my experience with my son also, I think, helped me with the other veterans. I also worked at Sanford Health System in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, the reason for that is because I was in training and they want to get you, you know, like, you got to go do this, so at least you can say you've done it. Well, so in order to get experience working with children, uh, obviously there are no children at a veterans hospital, so they sent me to the local hospital, and I worked in the pediatric intensive care unit uh, at Sanford. So that's sort of my background. Then I was hired at Mercy Hospital in a northern suburb of Minneapolis, and I worked in the heart wing for heart transplants, so I was the primary uh, support there. And I also worked in their locked mental health uh, unit there. And after that, I did that for a year, and then I had an opportunity to do, become a hospice chaplain, and it was uh, primarily home hospice. And that's where I learned that home hospice doesn't necessarily mean in your home, because your home might be a nursing home at that point. So home hospice just means it's not in a place dedicated to hospice. It's anywhere, you know, wherever you happen to live is home hospice. So <clears throat> today, I am primarily a writer. Uh, I'm actually a full full time employee as a technical writer, uh, but I also speak uh, on behalf of Final Exit Network, and I also do holistic stress management. And I call it holistic because, and this is an interesting crowd for this, the humanists. You know, what does that mean? I um, it's been a long time since I've been to church. I'm actually an ordained minister, but I consider myself spiritual but not religious, because I think one of the best things you can do. For anything about spirituality is go take a walk out in nature, you know. So um, a lot of my clergy think I'm one of the enemy, but whatever. So uh, I do teach, I treat stress management because what, what I do is I combine techniques that I found work for the veterans. And when I found techniques that work for veterans, whether they're World War II, Korea, Vietnam, or Afghanistan, and by the way, never mentioning religion or God or anything. So contrary to myth, uh, being a chaplain has very, very little, at least a professional chaplain, has very, very little to do with religion. It's about relationships. It's about community. And one of the most common stories I heard was somebody went off to war completely supported by their community. They came back and they were not welcome. What happened? That conversation was very, very common. So um, I actually studied meditation with a Buddhist monk for a while. Uh, so that was fascinating, and I and I do some of that on my own. So and I teach that uh, when I have the opportunity. So depending on your definition of these three terms, I define myself either as an agnostic, an atheist, or a humanist, or spiritual, but not religious. So we can talk about what the terminology are terminology is. And so let's get right into it. This is going to be a, a interactive. Where do you want to die? Go ahead. Somebody just yell at home. At home. There you go. Well, I want to die suddenly. Suddenly. Unexpectedly. Okay. So I'm in my normal life. Thank you for that comment. I gave a talk like this in northern Minnesota a while ago, and I asked that question. And appropriately, it was a woman from the back who actually said, on a zip line with my hair on fire. <laughs> I don't quite know how to follow up with that, but 80% uh, of people want to die at home. Well, the sad reality is this. Only 31% of us will die at home. That's the way it is. The other 69% are in some institution or facility. Break that down. Most of them are in a hospital. A few of them are nursing homes. 8% are in, in a dedicated hospice facility. And then the other 10%, I'm not quite sure what that is. So... If you are in a hospital, when you die, it'll probably look something like that. That is where most of us will go if we don't make sure it doesn't happen that way. So the question is, are you prepared for that not to be the way you want to leave this world? So a question for you. How many of you have a health care directive? How many of you have a living will? How many of you know that's basically the same thing? 
depending on which state you're in. Okay, good. Now, those of you who have a health care directive, hasn't been updated in the last five years. Mm -hmm. Those of you who have a health care directive updated in the last five years, does your next door neighbor know where to find it? Because if you're unconscious, it doesn't matter where, you know, it, in a, in a lockbox in the bank, doesn't anybody any good. I saw, I worked in the emergency rooms of several hospitals. I saw several patients' health care directives completely ignored because the doctor wasn't sure it hadn't been updated since the copy they have in there. So there's a second part of this. Do you have somebody designated as a power of attorney? It's the combination that makes sure your wishes are, are fulfilled. As I mentioned, I work in the ERs and I've heard many stories, uh, similar things. Even at a hospital that is your hospital and your primary care physician happens to be on duty and they know you, there's no guarantee that they will follow your wishes. Because yesterday the hospital got bought out by a Catholic organization and they have new policies. The only way to make sure that your end of life decisions are followed is if you have a person designated as a power attorney who is waving your advanced care directive in the doctor's face saying, you will follow these or I will own this hospital tomorrow. Capiche? That is the way to make sure it's done. So health care directive, advanced care directive, and the power of attorney to speak for you. Very, very important. Anybody written your own funeral yet? The, the best advice I ever gave anybody in a hospital as a hospice chaplain is to plan your own funeral. <clears throat> I know that because that is what I was thanked for the most often by family members afterwards. They said, thank you so much. We thought you were crazy at the time, but you saved us such headaches because we knew exactly what mom wanted. We knew what songs she liked. I can't tell you, family reunions and funerals, the emotions come up. And everybody has a different memory, a different thought of what mom or dad or grandma might have wanted. So I highly suggest you make your own funeral. Make your own funeral plans. Everything down there. And there's a good chance that someone that you want to sing for you, you end up outliving them. So have a plan B. So a primary person and a secondary person for your own funeral. And you will save your family a lot of headaches. All right. So we mentioned the 31% home and 69%. So 69%, here's some other percentages for a game show here. What percentage of people have surgery in the last month of life? You can guess. Actually, it's not so bad. However, if you think about it, why would you have surgery in the last month of your life? If you probably know it's going to be the last month of your life? Because you're not conscious to speak for yourself. And the doctors want to experiment on you. So they get published in the New England Journal of Medicine as having cured some strange disease. Or because they don't care because insurance will pay for it anyway. Question? Yes. I think to interrupt you, but I'm really interested. Um, in your statistics, are you including people who are maybe younger but dying by accidents? Uh, actually, Jenna, the, the, the numbers are awfully close. Um, the vast majority of people, even though we hear it in the headlines of, <laughs> of uh, younger people dying by accidents, but still the vast majority of people who die are over 80 years old. Okay. So now here's another one. 10% of people will have surgery in the last week of life. And often they don't want it, but they can't speak for themselves and they end up getting it. In fact, I personally heard a story just a couple of weeks ago uh, about a woman who had a shoulder replacement surgery oh. eight days before she died. She was a hospice patient. Oh Replace a soldier, a sh uh, shoulder. All right. So. Less than 25, you, you are very educated and very with it, good for you, because the statistics, less than 25% of Americans have an advanced directive and a POA. Here's another one. 40% of nursing home patients with dementia will get a feeding tube, often against their will. 50% of us will not have the capacity to speak on our own behalf, so you better make sure someone can. Little humanist history for you. Anybody recognize these guys? On the left is Felix Adler. On the right is uh, Robert Ingersoll. Both prominent humanists in their day. 
And it was the late 1890s, 1891 and 1894, respectively, is when they make their proclamations. Uh, Felix Adler was the first prominent American to openly speak on behalf of what they referred to then as, as uh, assisted suicide. He said anybody should have the right to do it, and they should have the right to have assistance by a physician or a family member if, if they wanted to. Uh, Robert Ingersoll uh, also did the same thing. Uh, coincidentally, both of them came from very religious families. Felix Adler's father was the first rabbi of the Reformed Synagogue of mm -hmm. New York. And uh, Robert uh, Ingersoll's father was also a pastor, very religiously conservative. They became famous for beginning the planting the seeds for the uh, assisted suicide or at least starting the conversation about it. And things kind of dropped away because we had this thing called World War I came up and then World War II came up. And then when the Nazi death camps came out, suddenly assisted suicide was something you don't talk about because people talk about euthanasia and people were put, against, put to death against their will. And it just became a topic you simply couldn't talk about. So things kind of went away for a while. But I just want to let you know that the, the right to die movement has very strong humanist roots. So one of the gentlemen here who had the book. There you go. Gentleman back there. So final exit. This gentleman is Derek Humphrey. Uh, he was a Brit, actually. Uh, in 1978, 9, somewhere around there, his wife, Jean, uh, they were living in Britain, and she had been surviving breast cancer that had metastasized in stage four and all that. And he helped her end her life. It just happened to be that he was a journalist. And so he wrote about it. And he wrote a book called Jean's Way. And he published it. Openly admitted he helped his, end his wife's life. There was such a public outcry of support that the police didn't dare arrest him. They had the laws on the books. They could have thrown him in the jail. But by then... They said, absolutely. And so he was never arrested. He was questioned. And he said, yep, this is what I did. Yep, this is what I did. And the key was, even though he handed her the medication, she took it herself. And that was the key. You had to be able to self-administer it. So that's the Gene's way. And then he wrote Final Exit. Uh, he moved to America. And then I think it was 1980, he started the Hemlock Society, if you've ever heard of that. He's the man who started the Hemlock Society. So it started in 1980, and it grew. Uh, he went around the world on his normal talking kind of things. It changed forms, and people joined, and they had different names for various reasons. And in 2004, there was a bit of an intentional split. And the split ended up with two organizations. One is called Compassion and Choices. You may have heard of them. They are the primary lobbying group behind getting medical aid and dying laws passed. You may know Oregon was the first one. Now we have nine others. The other one was Final Exit Network. So what Compassion and Choices focus on is just legislation. All they do is go out and talk about, please write to your congressman, whatever, help us get these laws passed to allow medical aid and dying. Final Exit Network provides personal support to people who are going through the process. Now, it's just a political reality uh, that sometimes you have to make a law so restrictive in order to get it passed that it leaves a lot of people out. They, those people are often the people who come to us. So, right to choose. And what about our right to choose what you do? All right, so this cartoon is up here because those – Three caricatures represent three segments of our population who oppose what we do. First one is the medical industry. They don't want us to have this choice. Why not? We mentioned the spending. Okay, so 30% of all Medicare dollars spent are spent in the last year of your life. Of that, 40% is the last 30 days of your life. I could make an argument that this is purely an economic solution. All the money we spend in Medicare on a shoulder surgery in the last week of your life that you didn't want, there's something wrong with this process here. So here's another one. Medical ethics prevent me from assisting in your death. However, I'm allowed to keep you miserable as long as possible. So what are the current options? If you are facing an end-of-life uh, illness or one that you suspect – uh, is either going to be painful or terminal within the next uh, uh, immediate treatment. 
or immediate future. If you're cap mentally capable, so capable means I can make my own decisions. Incapable, you need to have an agent or a directive working for you. Whether you're capable or incapable, you can refuse treatment. Either you can do it personally or your power of attorney can say, no, their mom said she doesn't want that. The other option is to discontinue treatment. Even if you have begun treatment, you can say, no, I'm done. You know, we often hear that with dialysis or chemo. If, you, if you're incapable, you can, your agent can say, no, we're done with that. Even, you know, that's the classic is unhooking the feeding tubes or whatever, or the, uh, the life-stating treatment. The third option for capable is stopping eating and drinking. And the acronym V said stands for voluntary cessation of eating and drinking. The medical industry has to come up with some acronym. And it basically means I'm done eating and you can't make me. That is probably one of the most common ways to die in the hospital today. They simply say, I'm done. And statistically, from the time you stop taking any kind of nutrition or hydration, it's about 10 days. It may or may not be painful. Depends on all kinds of things. There's a little something, a little dirty secret in the hospice industry called palliative sedation. And not just hospice, but hospital. Slow down here. It is perfectly legal for a physician to give you enough morphine to ease your pain, knowing it will likely stop your heart. The key is, is the, is the uh, physician doing it to kill you, or is the physician doing it to ease your pain? So at sedation, they put you to sleep, basically, in order to ease your pain. But they give you just a little bit more morphine than you probably absolutely need. Well, there's called the uh, double effect. I'm doing this for good purposes, but there's a darn good chance that your heart's going to stop, and I know it. But because of this doctrine, it's actually called a doctrine because it started in the Catholic Church, or the principle of double effect is what allows today a hospice or a hospital physician to give you just a little enough more than you absolutely need, knowing that you probably will be dead within a minute or two. So the fact that these exist is what allows the conversation to even go forward. So today, the most common reference, references are medical aid in dying or physician-aided death. And you might also hear physician-assisted suicide. Let's briefly look. Where is it legal? Well, right now it's legal in Oregon. I mentioned that was the first state. We have Washington. They came along shortly after that. And then Montana, Vermont, California, Colorado. Over on the East Coast, we have Washington, D.C., and then Hawaii and, and uh, New Jersey are the last ones. So those are where it is currently legal to pursue a physician helping you to die. But there are many, many restrictions. So what are those requirements? Number one, you have to be an adult. You have to be a legal resident of the state. And I learned that that depends on each state. Right now, I've been in communication with somebody who lives in New Mexico, and they said, well, why don't we just move to Colorado? Great, but then you have to have a one-year residency. And each state is different. So you have to be a legal resident. You have to have a terminal diagnosis by a licensed physician that you will likely die within six months anyway. That basically uh, makes you eligible for hospice care, in, in, uh, legally, medically. You have to be able to self-administer. This usually means swallow. There are a couple of other ways you can do it, but you have to be able to do it yourself. And it's usually swallowing. But what if you have throat cancer? You know, what if you're on a feeding tube already? You can be conscious and still have an ear tube. You can't swallow. You have to give two oral requests to your attending physicians, and they have to be 15 days apart. And to make sure you're not changing your mind. And you have to give a written request to two attending physicians and they have to be two witnesses, and one of them cannot be related to you. Yes, sir. Oh, the, thank you. Thank you. The reason for that is because it was not voted on. It was just passed by a court. It was passed by legislation. So it's legal, but it was never put up to the public for a vote. It's just a different way they got it legalized. Um. One thing I did not put there, was, oh, yes, I did. So that's what the patient has to do. The physician has to confirm your diagnosis and prognosis with another physician, consulting. It has to be a two-person thing. 
the two of them have to agree that the patient is fully capable. Remember earlier I said capable means mentally competent. So are you acting on your own and are you able to make the decision? They have to agree on that. If either of them have any questions about it, they automatically get referred for a psyche eval. So now you've got three people who have to agree on it. They all, three of them, if they have psych evals involved, but the first two at least, they have to confirm the patient is acting voluntarily. That's the number one rule. They have to both separately offer the option to not go forward with that, whatever their request is. is. Are you sure you want to do this? It's like almost every day. You ready to change your mind? Ready to change your mind? Ready to change your mind? I think that's kind of coercion the other way. You know, you get to a certain point. You have to be counseled on the use and potential side effects of this medication you're about to give. And I'm thinking, side effect to the medication that I want to kill me? What could, you know? So anyway, you have to be informed of all the alternatives, including hospice. And you have to be willing to notify your next of kin. So all of these are required. The physician actually has to call your next of kin. All of these are required on the physician's part. Even in those nine states where it's legal, these are the requirements the physician has to do. And by the way, a physician doesn't have to do it, any of it. Each physician has the right to say, I will not participate due to my own ethical or religious code. It could be your primary care physician, and they say, no, nope, sorry, I can't help you. It's against my religion, politics, name it. All right, so what question comes up a lot? Is it suicide? Well, it depends on who you ask. Having worked in mental health, if you go out and call somebody suicidal, that usually refers to a mental state, usually depression or that kind of thing. And it's often considered a very impulsive thing. You've probably heard that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So if you are suffering from clinical depression or a mental illness, or if it's considered impulsive, those would be suicide. Well, <clears throat> That's not an impulsive thing. It's a very deliberate, well thought out thing. So that gets rid of the impulsivity around it. Uh, oh, clinical depression or mental illness, that gets back to the psyche valve. So if, if, if you have a significant amount of depression, you're probably automatically disqualified from medical aid. All right. So I want to run through a couple of these. These are the classic, there's four classic objections that society has to medical aid and dying. They call it the slippery slope, the ethical argument, slippery slope. They say, well, it's going to lead to an epidemic of suicides. By the way, from an ethicist, and it was actually my graduate school ethics professor who said, the slippery slope has no basis in fact. <coughs> and people will say, well, think about Hitler. You know, if they would have stopped him here, they wouldn't have gone there. I said, no, 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 no. If you read Mein Kampf, you know from day one he wanted the whole world. So it's not like we, you know, the whole give them an inch and they'll take a mile. No, they wanted a mile right away, but they thought they could get an inch from you. So the whole slippery slope ethical argument actually has no basis in fact. The other thing is abuse. They're afraid of abuse, either by a doctor or by greedy relatives. They want grandpa dead so they can get the 59 Chevy. Uh, some claim it's discriminatory. The poor can't afford uh, good palliative care. So we want to get rid of them. And the fourth argument is the euthanasia. You know, we're actually killing people who we just don't think belong in society. And they bring up the Nazi death camps as examples. So responses to these, contrary to what people thought, and I have a lot of respect for the Oregon people because they had no data to back up what they hoped would happen. But now, 20-some years later, we have data to prove that these objections had no basis in fact. Over a 20-year average, less than 65% of the people who actually had the prescription actually used it. They had it in the drawer, and they chose not to use it. They died either before they would have, or they decided not, just decided not to. As a hospice chaplain, I was in a unique opportunity to be with some of these people who had the medication right there they could have used. And I actually asked, I said, okay, are you planning to do this? And they said, well, you know, just knowing it's there is good enough. I can cope with what's going on, just knowing it's an option. So you got 30 some percent of people who just, just having it there is enough, enough to help them cope. 
Abuse. No. Over 20 years, there has not been a single case of abuse. No. No legal actions. Uh, no physicians have lost their license. No greedy relatives. There's been no case of any kind of abuse in the 20 years uh, uh, as of the statistics here. Uh, and, and this is about medical aid and dying. The discriminatory, contrary to what the uh, objections were, most people who do medical aid and dying are quite affluent. They're knowledgeable. They know the questions to ask. The vast major majority of them are college educated. Many of them have doctorates or master's degrees. Um, so it's simply not. In fact, I think I could make an argument that not making this available is discriminatory. Euthanasia, there are so many safeguards in the law that that's just really not even a talking point anymore. Um, it's all about your individual choice, you know, making sure there's no coercion going on. So those were the four main objections that came up in legislation, and those are the responses. All right, so our second group are their churches. That's, they don't like it. Why don't they like it? Well, I, it's kind of funny, actually, because working in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which is not exactly a liberal hotbed, um, I, I was amazed because I would have patients, families coming to me, chaplain, chaplain, you have to stop the doctor from doing this. It says right here in scripture they're not allowed to do it. Meanwhile, what they don't know is that an hour earlier, I had the same th thing happening, saying, chaplain, chaplain, please make the doctor do this. It's in the scripture. They're quoting the same scripture for either withholding all care or making sure that all care possible. So it's one of my favorite quotes now is um, it's amazing how much the voice of God sounds like you in your head. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but some of the, I tend to be a little bit too objective, which is probably why I'm not a Sunday morning pastor. I was told I don't have a pastoral presence. Um, I just say, okay, so you're in the hospital. How'd you get here? 911? Where'd you get the phone? Did God hand that to you? If you're in the hospital or if you pick up 911, you're already thwarting the will of God. So unless you're going to be home on whatever, do you take aspirin, vitamins? Where does that come from? Unless you're out there pulling it off of an aspergum tree, you know, uh, so it's, well, do we do nothing or do we do, do everything? I've seen them both. So, all right. Any former Catholics here? All right. I'm a former Missouri Synod. And by the way, I used to say recovering. But I realized, you know, that's not really fair because I have realized that I was where I needed to be at that time. And anybody who is a Catholic today, whatever serves you well, go with it. If it's working for you, stick with it. I'm not going to try to talk anybody out of their theology or belief system because it's working for you or you wouldn't be doing it. However, the Catholic Church is the single biggest, most organized opposition to anything that we do. And they base it on this thing called redemptive suffering. And it's based on a quotation from Scripture, when we are made to suffer, it is for our consolation and salvation. Well, this is a bunch of people who are being persecuted. You know, back in the time of St. Paul. It's Paul's letter to the Corinthians, by the way. John Paul II, the Pope, used that quote uh, Bible verse to come up with this other long quote. You can become a sharer in the redemptive suffering of Christ. So now this re idea of redemptive suffering means the more you suffer, the more you're like Christ. So it's a good thing. And I'm like, really? My response is? I don't care what your theology is. If you want someone to suffer, you're not compassionate. You're sadistic. I don't care what's going on. If you want somebody to suffer, you are sadistic. No ifs, ands, or buts. However, if a Catholic or anybody else comes to me with that theology, I actually don't argue with them about it. Instead, I like to go this direction. Oh, do you think pain and suffering is the biggest reason that people want to end their lives? Well, yes, they usually say. Not so. Number one reason people want to end their lives under their own control is the loss of autonomy. By far, they are simply tired of not having control. 
It's not about pain because today our medication is such that we can pretty much mitigate most pain. Not all, but most. Losing autonomy. Life is simply no longer enjoyable. Why shouldn't I have the right to say goodbye and have help from my loved ones if I want it? Losing control of your bodily functions. You feel like you're a burden on family or friends. And then the pain control. And then finance is actually at the very bottom. So if anybody says, well, you're, this, is not, this is about pain. No, it's not. This is about personal dignity and how you define dignity. So a little moment, because I am an ordained minister, I always have to go here. There are six references to suicide in the Christian and Jewish scriptures. One of them actually includes two deaths. But surprise, surprise, in every single one of these, the person who did it is not condemned. In fact, they're held as heroes. I grew up thinking about Samson as a big biblical hero. I want to grow up and be like Samson. Obviously, I didn't get the hair to go along with it. But Samson is considered a hero. But in the end, he killed himself by pulling down the pillars on the people around him. But in every single instance, including Judas, the one who committed suicide after supposedly betraying Jesus, they never say that what he did was wrong. You can't find it. All right. The other thing is they say, well, it violates the sixth commandment, which I learned as thou shalt not kill. And then learned in graduate school, that's actually incorrect. And this is a really important distinction that people don't get. It's thou shalt not murder. And in the ancient Hebraic language, murder was very specifically defined as the deliberate taking of another's life with malice. And every word is important. Taking implies an act of violence. Just think about the word take. You take it from you, the T and the K and they take it. So in the ancient uh, Hebraic language, if I give you something, I have removed the possibility of you taking it. Now you are receiving it. The only way you can take anything from me is if, I, if it's against my will. So it's the taking of another's life. Okay, well, if you're doing this to yourself, automatically it's there. And with malice. I challenge anybody who has been at the bedside of a dying relative to say that what they're doing is out of malice. It's out of love. So it simply doesn't qualify as violating the Sixth Commandment. Now, you guys may not care, but it's, I want to give you some good ammunition for the next coffee, coffee time you have with a good <laughs> Southern Baptist. <laughs> All right, you talked about the Hemlock Society and compassion and choices as the, the legal stuff. So Final Exit Network, uh, that's who I'm representing. Our mission statement, we educate qualified individuals in practical, peaceful ways to end their lives. We offer compassionate bedside presence, and we will defend your right to choose. And when I say defend, I mean in court. We have our own lawyer. I have been in court several times. I testified at the Minnesota State Senate. Uh, we will go to court for you on your behalf. That is our mission. Who are we? We are about 3,000 people nationwide. 90-some uh, people are volunteers uh, who are active, like myself. We have physicians. We have a medical evaluation committee that screens all applicants. We have psychiatrists, psychologists, and all those up there that you can see there. Uh, it's really quite surprising, by the way, how many formal nurses join our group because they finally aren't restricted by hospital policy. All right, now, why would you want to choose Final Exit Network? Well, I mentioned earlier you saw all the restrictions. If you have Parkinson's, MS, MD, ALS, which is also Lou Gehrig's disease, any one of cerebral cancers, or if you had a stroke, or any one of these things, none of them are necessarily terminal or fatal. You could have one of these events or one of these diseases and live for a long time. You might wish you weren't alive, but these would automatically not qualify you for medical aid and dying because you're not necessarily within the last six months of your life. So people who have any one of these neuromuscular degenerative kinds of diseases, they're definitely suffering, but they're not eligible because they're not within six months. So one of the differences we have is in order to be helped by FEN, 
you do not need to have a medical prognosis of having six months left. There's no prescription involved. You don't have to have a doctor involved at all. Your personal physician doesn't have to know what you're doing. We would prefer that you do have a supportive doctor, but it's not their decision. Why? Because this is your decision. Compassion and choice as people, and I actually have a good working relationship with them because uh, I used to work with them. They very proudly say it's a team decision. It's between your physician and you. I'm thinking, and no, I'm done with my physician. This is my choice. I don't think it should be my doctor's choice. I don't, don't think it should be politicians' choices or bureaucrats' choice. It certainly shouldn't be Trump's choice or the next president's choice. What or when or how I die. And here's something that kind of freaks people out. One of the things we do is we continually research new ways to peacefully end your life. One of the reasons we do this is because the method, uh, the final exit book that the gentleman had today, the first edition talked about we used helium. What it does is, and I'm not going to get into details, but basically it's you end up breathing in helium instead of oxygen. Eventually your brain will die. Well, the helium industry found out we were doing this, and they started to dilute the helium at Party City. Now we don't use helium. We use nitrogen. Well, because it's nitrogen, now you have to have a regulator on the tank. So it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, but we're always researching this because there's always somebody trying to shut us down. So we always have to be looking at, well, what's, what's the plan B? Because we got people waiting for us. Literally, when I was in the car today pulling up here, I got off the phone with somebody in Albuquerque who is probably going to be my next client. So we have people waiting. We can't be dealing with some politician deciding they're going to kowtow to the local Catholic church for the next six months. And we are predominantly volunteers. It used to be 100% volunteers, but we've changed our business model. We now do have a paid executive director, and the person who runs our exit guide services is also paid. So we have two paid individuals. The rest of us are all volunteers. Contrasting that with Compassion and Choices, all of their leadership are paid professionals. So... I mentioned the requirements for legal medical aid in dying. What are our requirements? Yes, you do have to be mentally competent. I could possibly make an argument, having worked in mental health, that who am I to judge that the pain between your ears is any less than the pain in your chest from lung cancer? I could make an arguable and I think theologically sound argument that suffering from depression you should be able to end your life if you've been suffering from depression because it's not for me to judge. It's simply not for me to judge. In fact, when Robin Williams uh, ended his life, there was some talking head on Fox who was calling him a coward. And we've all heard, you know, suicide is the coward's way out. And I saw a really interesting perspective on that. And, he, and this guy said, think about all of the stories we've heard of prisoners of war or the mother who miraculously lifts a car off of her child. And it's amazing what we can do to live or if what our child can live. On a metaphysical and even scientific level, the will to live is probably the single strongest force in the universe ever. Now, imagine something stronger than that. Imagine living with that in your head for 10 years. That's what Robin Williams did. I don't think he's a coward. I choose to praise him for dealing with it for 10 years instead of saying, how could you do that to your family? I'm thinking, wow, you dealt with that for 10 years? So um, <clears throat> you have to be competent. And we have, this is just a blurb. You have to have, and this is a quote, an existing or reasonably anticipated unbearable suffering or an unacceptable, intolerable quality of life with no reasonable hope of improvement. However, you get to decide what is an intolerable quality of life. This is your decision, not the doctor's. You have to be aware of your treatment options. It's my job just to say, okay, were we the first people you called because you broke up with your boyfriend? Or is there something more serious here? You know, we have to be very careful about our screening. And you have to at least tell us that you're willing to talk to your family. You don't have to tell them because you may have somebody who would oppose this. 
but we still come back to this is your choice. So you have to tell us that you're at least willing to. Now, I have the right as an exit guide to say, you're telling me your husband is absolutely opposed to you doing this? Yeah. And where is he going to be during this? Well, he's going to be right there. Okay. And why is he on his phone? Well, to call 911. I'm sorry, we can't help you. So it's important for us to maintain as an organization that family be supportive. Other requirements, you do have to do a signed statement and what your medical condition is. You have to explain to us what are your values about end of life. Um, and you have to very specifically say, what do you want us to do? Do you know what the end result of this is? We're not just having tea here. When I leave, you will get dead. You know, it's, so it's like, do you really realize what we're talking about here? This is not high in the sky stuff. So those are the two lists of requirements that you have. So the process. We have somebody who calls a coordinator, and they're the ones who first get an application. That coordinator then will select an interviewer. And the interviewer simply calls the person and say, hi, I'm with Final Exit Network, and I have your application. Let's go over it. So they make sure, you know, spelling and stuff, but they're always listening. They're just listening, and they have a specific uh, number of questions. By the way, have any of you ever been, like, in an emergency room, and you get so tired of the nurses asking you the same damn question over and over again? Like, okay, name, birth date. You know, the reason they do that is to check in to see if you had a concussion. Our process, we ask the same questions over and over again to see if you have different answers. It's okay. We just want to see, okay, what has changed? So the interviewer then refers it all to the medical evaluation committee. That's MEC. The medical evaluation committee consists of nine physicians. Some are still active, by the way, physicians. And they simply look at the application, look at the, the paperwork and say, okay, yeah, this makes sense. They didn't make this stuff up. It's been Google WebMD and come up with a disease. We also had to get documentation from the diagnosis. If someone diagn diagnosed you with cancer, let me see it on paper. Hospital needs to send it in. So then after the MEC says, yep, they've passed, then they choose the, uh, the coordinator actually assigns a senior guide, usually based on geography. The senior guide then picks an associate guide. So there are always two people to always check and balance. The senior guide will call the client and the associate guy will call the client. And we will say, we're going to ask you questions you've already heard before, and this is why. So we've got three people now who have asked the same questions to get to know what's going on. Are you still wanting to do this? Da, 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 da. Then after the first phone call, we say, all right, if you still want to do this, we will send you a list of the equipment that you need to buy. Let us know when you have it. We don't say, I'll call you next week to see if you're ready. It has to be completely in the other way. They have to be in control, even if they don't want to be. No, sorry, I'm not going to call you next Tuesday. You call me when you're ready to move forward. After they purchase the equipment, and by the way, that was the phone call I got. Just want to let you know I got the equipment. Uh, so after they purchase the equipment, we make arrangements for the senior and the associate to go visit them, and we have an educational visit. In other words, we teach them how to do this. And it's a whole helium nitrogen tank and how it all works. We go over, do you have your will? Do you have advanced directive? Do you have you know, all your affairs in order and all that kind of stuff? So we have the, the initial exit. Okay, you're done. At that point, whether we ever see them again is completely up to them because they have the knowledge and equipment they need to do this themselves. More often than not, they want us to come back, but it's not to help. In fact, we don't touch anything unless they offer us a glass of water. They have to do everything themselves because otherwise we would be assisting a suicide. And in order to maintain the integrity of the organization, I can't go there. Oops, did I miss up? All right, so the guides visit either once or twice. So that's what I'm looking for. Okay, sure, sure. So what will FEN do? We will very carefully screen everybody. We will provide counseling. I am one of several licensed counselors who are on the board who do this, and we will 100% support your decision. What we will not do, we will not encourage you to do this. We don't care. I might care, but we don't care. 
We will not provide the means and we will not provide any physical assistance. There's a window of opportunity. If you get to dementia and cancer, you need to act sooner than you might want to because once you're no longer able to speak for yourself or do the, the physical need thing you need to, we can't help you. So you need to be able to open a jar of jelly, a new jar of jelly from the uh, grocery store, and you have, have to be able to carry two gallons of milk across the hall because those are the muscles used in opening up a valve of helium. And you have to be able to have your hands above your head. So if you can do those three things, then you're physically capable. So if you have neuromuscular degeneration or any of that thing, there's a window of opportunity. And what, what uh, Derek Humphrey said is, especially for dementia patients, you have to leave some good time on the table while you still have control. So that's our mission. We educate people. I mentioned that before. We'll defend your rights to choose. Um, so that's just kind of who we are. And then we get the politicians, and that's mostly about the money. The more money they get from Medicare and whatnot, the more they're in there. Talked about why is suicide a crime, if you think it's suicide or not. The biggest thing is, and then I'm going to stop here, is the reason suicide was ever uh, considered a crime is because once upon a time you did not own yourself. You belonged to the king. So you killing yourself wasn't a problem. You killing yourself was stealing from the king. That's the crime you were accused of. It's okay to go into battle for the king, but you're not allowed to take a resource from the king, and you are a resource. That stigma has held over. Suicide is no longer a crime, but the stigma has held over, and so assisted suicide is still a crime. But um, my brother happens to be here, and we had the blessing of, of having our mother pass away at the healthy age of 96, and it was a glorious thing. It, I can't imagine it going any better. Uh, but I'll just tell you right here, if she had, because she knows what I do, if she had asked me to help her six weeks ago, absolutely. No question. Will I go to jail? I don't care. Because <laughs> it's my mother. Of course I'm going to help her do what she, what she wants me to do. So uh, it's the state's interest. Well, what exactly is the state's interest in me staying alive? <clears throat> Think about that. <laughs> Who pays taxes? Mm -hmm. Dead people don't pay taxes. Anytime you ever hear the state's interest in keeping you alive, it's nothing more than so that you continue to pay taxes. Because I'm sorry, but I don't think Trump cares whether I live or die. He doesn't know I exist. But the local taxpayers, I mean, the local, my local community where I pay my property taxes, they want me to stay alive as long as possible and continue to pay for the roads, even if I'm not using them. So uh, we can talk about noble death. That's throughout history you know, avoiding capture. But uh, hospice, I do need to say, hospice doesn't always work for everybody. I think it's a wonderful situation, but it does not meet everyone's needs. So I'm going to end there because I'm out of time. So thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to end here saying, what can you do? Read the book. Talk to your family now about what you would like. Become a member of FEN now because that helps our numbers. It's not about the money. We have money. But if we can turn around and say, we have 4,000 members, then the press goes, really? Okay, I want your story. So that's why it's important to join now if you can. Membership is free, by the way. We just having your name on the roll. Um, living will, durable POA. And more importantly, we have found that the vast, vast majority of people support what we do. But nobody knows we exist. The best thing you can do is invite me back or just let Fen know that you want someone to come to your own organization because uh, you give me a new word, the fear monger thing. I am an awareness monger. I want to raise awareness that we are an option. So thank you for your time. Thank you. 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 If you're game, uh, we'd love to, to open the floor for questions Absolutely. and answers. Great, great, great. Excellent, excellent. And this will be both in person. I'll, I'll moderate the, okay. uh, the Q&A. So please, please welcome Kevin Bradley back up. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you.
And uh, and by the way, this also holds online as well for our, our viewers who is, online. Who is monitoring uh, the chats? Uh, I, I'm monitoring okay. it right here. Okay. So, so yes. But, Generally, yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you very much for doing this. It's extremely helpful and appreciate it. You're very welcome. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions, one in particular. Um, can you offer any advice in answering those questions related to filling out a DNR? I, I often am faced with the DNR. Yes. And some of the questions seem to, to me to preclude the doctors taking uh, an action to resuscitate you, where mm -hmm. it's not clear to me that sometimes resuscitation may bring you back to full capacity. But other times it may not. So I'm confused as to, and if, it's, if, if I'm not being brought back to full capacity, so mm -hmm. like to reach out to you folks. Right. So yeah, the answer to your question is yes. One of the things we offer is we will help people figure out their DNR or your advanced care directive. We will help you navigate through the paperwork. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Brian. Yeah. Okay. Uh, since we have uh, a public option in Medicare for All um, and the debate on where uh, our medicine should go in the future, um, do you think that it's going to flip if we have like a single payer system where the government wants to keep the cost down instead of uh, getting kickbacks from the, the privatized um, uh, medicine uh, being paid by Medicare? Do you think that this narrative will flip and you support public option or Medicare for all? Or how do you think it's going to flip? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to be very unpopular right this second. <laughs> I do not support universal health care. And the reason for that is because then you're letting the government decide for you. I am all about individual choice, completely. As soon as the government controls what you can do, then they get to control what you cannot do. So there's a classic quote that a government big enough to provide for your every need is big enough to take away everything from you. And so I don't necessarily support government-run universal health care precisely because I don't want politicians making that decision for me. No, yes. Um, it's not clear to me whether you can do this in only those red states or whether you can do that everywhere. We can. We work in all 50 states. Okay. Right. Fen, fen, so that, thank you. I'm going to update this. We Final Exit Network is available all 50 states. Now, if you happen to live in a state where medical aid and dying is legal, you will call us, we will ask you about your diagnosis, and we will often refer you to that as an option for you. But it's not available in 40 other states. Other questions? Leonard. I have three, but I'll just start with one. Thank you. Um, what do you suggest for people who are beyond the stage where they can give consent or they can physically do the things that you describe they need to do? <laughs> No well, way. Final Exit Network cannot help you, but as I, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a loved one who knows what you wanted, that's all I can say about that, I guess. <laughs> well, I don't understand why that's all you can say, but... Because um, I'm still being streamed, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> and I represent Final Exit Network. I already kind of put myself out there on a personal level. Yeah. If I knew what my mom wanted to do, absolutely. I don't care what the law is. Uh, but Final Exit Network, uh, we have limitations in order to maintain the organization so that it can serve other people. And that's why I mentioned that window of opportunity. Now, to answer your question, well, what about people who have passed the window of opportunity? I would say, let's have coffee sometime and we can discuss it. Because as a hospice chaplain and as a hospital chaplain, yeah, I could, you know, I'm like right along with the CIA. I got 20 ways that I can help you, you know. It's like, Choking on a Brussels sprout will do it for you, right, Wayne? <laughs> yeah, you know, I asked my doctor this question, and he just refused to help. Yep, yep. So it's the V-set, the uh, stopping eating and drinking. That's usually the default option for people who have passed that window of opportunity, a simple stopping eating and drinking. Well, other two questions? Or you, should we go to player B over here first? Or, or uh, ah, yes, okay. So... Um, I have a couple questions too. Is, do you ever have people to try to get dementia and make that decision? And, and you mentioned that if you're getting dementia, obviously 
it was too far gone, you can't make the decision. But in your experience, have you had people with starting to get dementia make the decision? Yes. And then we have to say, sorry, we can't help you anymore. Well, no, before they got, well, they, they saw the, in other words, you're starting to get dementia, but they didn't get too far. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've, I've had uh, I've had more than one client who has been diagnosed with dementia and had cancer very prevalent in her family, and she said, "I'm not going that way." And so, the person you're sitting in front of her, she looked like a reasonably healthy seventy year old woman, but she had been diagnosed with dementia and she wanted to have that control. And then I have one follow up. Do you have volunteer, or do you take volunteers that are not doctors or not nurses? Oh yeah, or most of our volunteers. Do here to help the network, like somebody like me mm -hmm. living in Austin, even though I'm not in the medical profession, mm -hmm. to help you out. Oh yes, absolutely. And my advice would be, contact me or contact the fan, final exit network. Take any of these materials. They all have a way to contact the office. Tell me how can I help. We will find a place for you. Whatever you know. Uh, can you help write an article? Uh, can you can you talk to your local community? Can you invite me to you know anything? You can, we have all kinds of ways that you can help, regardless of what your background is. Two last questions. Yeah. Yes, um, real quick, and then one quick question ahead. about um, is it that is it suicide question? Mm -hmm. If it's determined that you're not depressed and it's not an impulsive act, um, does this suffice for those insurance policies that might preclude payment if it's suicide? I'm glad you asked a question. It's a common myth that suicide automatically disqualifies you from insurance, and that's not true. It varies from state to state, so you have to check. However, there's usually a suicide clause that if you end your life within two years of taking out your policy, then that may negate because then they think, well, then you had this plan. But if you take out a policy and then five years, 10 years later, you commit suicide, it will not affect your insurance. Brian and Leonard? Yeah, uh, I was going to ask, um, <laughs> what medications do the uh, legal states use and how much is your service? How much is their service? Your service. Our service is free. Oh, wow. We don't charge anything for anything we do. I'm not being paid to be here. Fen is covering my expenses, but we don't charge for anything. Wow. It's all supported by donations, and we get a lot of bequests. People put us in their will. Wow. Uh, so we're a very healthy 501c3 organization, and we, we don't charge for anything that we do. And what was your other question? Uh, the, the medications that they use for legal state. Oh, I really don't know. I, I know that they used to use uh, something, sequel barb. I'm not a doctor. I don't know. And that changes, and, and each individual state often has its own – changing uh, thing but now i do know that it's a uh, and this is only because i know this only because i went to a compassion and choices presentation about three weeks ago uh that they now use a combination of five drugs couldn't tell you what they are but they use five drugs you know one is to combat side effects of the other four you know so any other questions Last. Um, in listing the step-by-step -step procedure you guys to the point where you uh, you don't do it, but the person who administers the gas, I guess, for himself. Yes. I would like to know from that point what takes place. Is that a lengthy process of dying? Is that painful? Two minutes, guaranteed painless. In order for it to qualify for our services, it has to be painless, peaceful, quick, and certain. No little panic during the process. There is no panicking. There is no sense of anything. Completely volunteer, uh, and you are in complete control of the whole process until you go unconscious. From the time you go unconscious until the time your pulse stops is usually within five minutes. And it's guaranteed to work. No one. I will. Permanent. True. <laughs> the the process is it's kind of a do it yourself kit. It sounds kind of weird, but the reason for that is because we don't want that to happen. The worst thing that could happen is for this process to screw up. And then you end up in a coma. It's so over-engineered that you could make mistakes all along the way and it would still work. I personally guarantee it. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this. I, I, <laughs> good. Tell you what, we'll make a deal. I'll personally guarantee it if you put Finn in your will. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, thank, thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you, uh, our digital audience, for joining us today as well. Very yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. fantastic talk. I, I don't want to take any of these materials back. So, um, this happens to be my ugly mug in the front, an article I wrote. Um, but there, I brought newsletters, magazines, there are last three editions. I would like you to take five each and hand.